thank you all for joining. Uh, I'm a little sick, so I'm going to have to use a few notes. I hate slides as much as you do, but I'm still going to have to use some. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I'm doing with this topic and, and why I'm talking about it, why I am qualified or not qualified to talk about this. So I'm going to do a little bit of a short uh, dive into it. A few inspirations that I've had over the years and slowly moving towards um, how to prepare for stuff you can't actually prepare for. Um, I don't know if you, if any of you have read any of those books, I can heartily recommend them or at least passages of them. Uh, so the first one uh, is one I've read a very long time ago. And it, it basically to shorten it down, it deals with different ways of uh, preparing for death, um, which is not as uh, dark as, as you might think. Uh, the second one, um, the uh, Stoics, uh, especially Seneca, uh, sort of um, helps people to, uh, to cope with uh, different kinds of situations with uh, kind of with everyday life, but also with um, difficult circumstances. So I, I drew a lot of inspiration from that one. There is a book called uh, An Astronaut's Guide by a real astronaut. I can really recommend that one. There's a lot of interesting information on how NASA trains astronauts to deal with uh, unexpected, uh, unpredictable events out in space uh, when no one else is there to help them. Uh, and finally, there is uh, another um, book with a lot of information on, on how to train for um, difficult events, and that's extreme ownership. They um, give a little bit of insight on how the Navy SEALs uh, train for uh, difficult circumstances. And finally, um, the last book, um, I don't know if you've seen MacGyver at any point in, in your life. Um, the old series, not the new one. Um, this book is, is by one of the scientific advisors to the show. And uh, there's a lot um, of things that went into the show in the book. But the interesting things are it's, it's a lot uh, about um, evidence-based evidence uh, thinking, the scientific method, uh, first principles approach to problem solving, and improvisation. So these five books are um, those that I drew inspiration out of uh, while I was pretty much preparing for this talk. And they also encapsulate what this talk is, is or what this session is about. Um, now, most of what's in those books are um, anecdotal things. So there are little stories and descriptions on how other uh, people, other organizations uh, cope with challenges or have coped with challenges in the past, but they're not very prescriptive. There are a few things, a few books uh, that I like that actually are prescriptive and they're sort of my uh, everyday or, you know, my, my frequent practice in th that helps me to um, uh, prepare for um, unpredictable events. Um, so the first two are mostly about uh, meditation, and I'm going to say a little bit about, about that. Um, the uh, last two, Aging Well and Blue Zones, are about um, uh, interesting uh, research on how uh, people uh, age well and how they can leave, uh, live a happy and fulfilled life. Um, they're based on um, uh, very extensive research. Uh, the Aging Well book is about the Harvard Longitudinal Study. Um, so what uh, Harvard has done is to accompany people for 75 years, like for their entire lives. Um, and the people who participated in, in that study, um, um, so there were hundreds of people uh, participated in this, um, have some very interesting things to say on, on what makes a good life. <clears throat> and the Blue Zones book is uh, essentially it's a book about centennials, about people who are over 100 years old from different regions of the world, and they seem to have certain habits and things in common. 
And you can find those in Aging Well as well and in um, uh, partly uh, in, in the first two books too. Now the middle one, Authoring Your Life. Um, so there's a practice uh, called self-authoring. I don't know if, you've, if you're familiar with it, um, but it's, it's one of those things that can help you that don't really do anything uh, to um, actually prepare, but they, they will help you to um, prepare your own mindset, to prepare your um, emotions and, and sort of look into the future and um, try to figure out what uh, life should be like for you. So those, those are the practices, and that's just a, a short introduction, a um, little bit of background. Uh, to me, I've um, consulted and still do consult different organizations and their challenges. Some of them are pretty simple and straightforward. Others are very, very complex. And there are a certain group of organizations that I want to uh, address and that we can learn a lot from as individuals. And those are uh, called highly resilient organizations. So I'm going to also talk a little bit about, about those. This session, it's, it's about the unpredictable. So it's not about unexpected things, not about uncertain things. Um, and just to make clear what, what the difference is, um, if, if you're out in the jungle, you, you meet a tiger, um, it's not something that is unexpected. You expect other animals to be there. Um, if you meet it, it's pretty certain what it's going to do. There are only a few things that it, it can do. Um, but it's unpredictable. Like you can't predict at what point of time there will be a tiger in the bush, right? Um, so the great famine of the 14th century was um, also unpredictable, but it was also uh, unexpected. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the event, uh, basically it rained for two, three years straight and um, people couldn't raise any crops, animals started dying and uh, people even reverted to cannibalism. So it was a really, really bad time. But um, no one expected uh, this to last, you know, the rain to last for as, as long as it, uh, as it did. Um, though the effects and, and the, um, uh, what came out of that, that was pretty, pretty much certain. Um, the situation we're in now, the, the pandemic we have now, there was a circumstance like this uh, roughly 100 years ago, the Spanish flu. And um, that was also something that, is, that was pretty unpredictable, pretty unexpected in, in how it evolved. <clears throat> and it was also uh, pretty un uncertain in terms of what the effects are going to be long term. And the effects, as we know, in hindsight, were two world wars, basically. So things are not really a problem if they're, if they're certain. So death is pretty much certainty for all of us. Um, all of you who are in the call, uh, at some point, we're all going to go our way. Um, so it's something we can count on. It's something we can pretty easily prepare for. Um, things we expect, uh, they're not certainties, but we can expect a certain uh, occurrence, a certain predictability there. Um, there uh, so things like, uh, uh, comfortable life, uh, that asteroids are going to hit the earth, that we have volcanoes on earth and so on. So there are certain things we just expect to, to happen. Um, and then there are certain things we can, we can predict. We're not, um, we're not uh, pretty clear on what to expect out of them. Like the consequences will not be, will not be very clear, but we can predict with a high level of certainty that they are going to occur. Um, so if anything falls into these categories, it's not really a problem because you know how to deal with it, or at least you know that you can deal with it or you can prepare for it. Um, things get uh, problematic when they get fuzzy and when they get uncertain, uh, when they're unexpected, when they get unpredictable. <clears throat> and this is what it, what the whole session is about. So um, there's a, there's a big uh, well, it's not actually that big, but there's a community online, uh, both in the U.S. and in part in Europe, which is called the Prepper Community. Um, those are people who have like little backpacks stowed away with um, rations of food and water and 
things that they could just grab and run away with uh, in an emergency. Um, that's not what, what this is about. Um, preparing is also not about constantly worrying about the things that can happen or that are going to happen or that might happen. Um, uh, specifically, when you look at what's, how people are preparing for an ongoing situation, um, an on ongoing pandemic, and you can see panicky, hurt behavior starting to appear in, in different regions. And um, preparing is also not panicking and rushing out and, and, and um, trying to make sure that you get your toilet paper. So um, just to give you an overview of how I prepared or how I prepare, um, I started looking into this whole topic, into unpredictability and, and preparation. Um, after uh, reading something for, from Nicholas Taleb and then reading The Black Swan. And uh, that's when I sort of started uh, right after the 2008-2009 the uh, crisis to learn about um, how people actually can prepare for um, difficult situations. Um, so I started gathering information, started acquiring skills, um, uh, started to uh, actually make sure that I can react and act in a, in a difficult situation. Um, and then the actual gathering stuff started, started pretty late. But by the time uh, this pandemic hit, I actually didn't have anything to prepare because all I needed to do was check if everything was in order, buy some supplies, and that was pretty much it. <clears throat> so while a lot of people were out um, like buying stuff and, and getting their, their um, home office set up. Uh, what we started doing here was instead um, setting up a garden and uh, making sure all the plants we need are, are planted uh, just in case this goes on longer than, than anyone. So the approach that I learned to, to take over time is to not think in, in causes, but to think in effects. What I mean by that is, a lot of people, they think uh, when they're trying to predict uh, something or when they're trying to predict, uh, prepare for something that um, is difficult to predict, they're thinking in terms of scenarios and causes. So what if there's a terrorist attack on blah, blah, blah? What if this or that happens? So there's a lot of uh, causal thinking. So a certain situation happens and then you need to prepare for the effects of that. But if you think about it, that actually doesn't make a whole lot of sense because a lot of different situations can, aim, can have the same exact uh, same effect. So if an effect, for instance, is there's no water, there's no running water, there can be a, a whole range of different causes, different scenarios cause, uh, that, that lead to this. So it doesn't make sense to prepare uh, for unpredictability on a scenario by scenario basis, but instead think about uh, different effects and fault points. So what, what are the things in your system, in your environment that can actually break and then focus on that? Which leads me to the next point, which is focusing on failure. So if you look at um, highly resilient organizations, so things like uh, how an aircraft carrier, for instance, operates, um, there is a very strong focus on failure. So uh, people are trying to break the system that has been set up to make sure that the system is adaptable and resilient enough. This is also an approach that is taken by security uh, teams, for instance, uh, when they do pen testing of companies, which is basically a company inviting hackers to come and hack them uh, and to enter their rooms and steal data. And if they are able to do it, obviously, um, the security wasn't tight enough, the system wasn't adaptable enough, um, which is, by the way, one of the jobs MacGyver has in the TV series. Focusing on failure also means that you need to embrace complexity because if you have a, a, a system uh, in place, it'll, it's going to have a lot of complexity, a lot of moving parts, um, especially if you look at um, a highly... Uh, complex organizations, again, if you look at an aircraft carrier, you have, basically think about it in, in these terms, you have a, a frequency of flights sort of like Atlanta or San Francisco terminal, 
but all boiled down to a single runway with a single gate. And you have planes starting and landing at, at, that, same, uh, at that same lane, while that lane is moving two meters to both sides, uh, back and forth. Uh, there is seawater, so it's slippery. There's oil, it's slippery. And there's a bunch of 20-year-olds running around, taking care of the different uh, planes while they're landing and starting. And you have bombs and ammunition everywhere. And you need to pull this off with radio silence and very minimal lighting uh, and not kill anyone in the process. So a very complex organization. Now, if you don't embrace this complexity, if you try to simplify it, then all you're going to do is, is uh, ignore certain uh, elements of failure and then those failures will happen. And you can see this in how certain governments are handling the current crisis uh, by not uh, uh, shutting down uh, entire regions or cities, for, it, for instance. Um, people are quarantined, quarantined in, in one area, but then through transportation and other means, uh, the virus still spreads to, to um, other regions as well. So you really need to look at the entire complexity um, if you want to be able to um, prepare for, for something that is uh, unpredictable. Um, that means that the focus and the awareness of, of what you're doing needs to be on activity and not on um, scenarios. So uh, again, with the aircraft uh, example, uh, you need to look at what the different activities are and not so much uh, about not so much at how the different processes are, are set, up, set up or intertwined, uh, because those things can change and will have to change in a time of crisis. So for instance, if a plane uh, crashes into another one uh, while taking off, uh, you need to make sure that the activities that people are trained for, that those activities um, function and, um, uh, and less pay attention on having a protocol for what happens if you know a plane crashes in a certain way because there will be a very long list of scenarios that you would then have to uh, consider. Um, this is an approach that um, the, the SEALs or uh, the uh, NASA uh, takes in training their astronauts. They still train for scenarios, but it's less about making sure that they've covered every possible angle, but it's more about um, having an awareness for the different uh, activities that are possible and the different uh, fault points, the different failures that are possible in a complex system. Once you, you prepare in that way, uh, then you actually have to give up control and expect to improvise at all times. Um, because there's only so much training, capacity building, and awareness uh, that you can have uh, at some point, uh, what you need to make sure is that the organization can react, that people can react. So one thing that you see in highly resilient organizations is uh, they actually improvise more than you would think. Um, because trying to hold on to control while a crisis is going on is, is basically a recipe for disaster. Because those things you do control, they're going to work. But then everything else is not going to go according to plan. So when people also prepare for unpredictable events, what they need to do is um, to make sure that they've built the, their own capacity, that uh, they've tried to break their own systems and, uh, and then learned to uh, think about the effects that, that can happen um, in, in different uh, conditions, but focus less on you know, what if scenarios. Uh, and finally, um, uh, an approach that highly resilient organizations and people in those organizations take is they de really defer to experts and to data. And they don't defer to their so social circle because that way uh, danger lies. Um, you know, if you, if you build your own actions and reactions on what's going on in your circle, uh, what's going on in your network, then you're just inviting a lot of cognitive bias and um, deferring to the social circle is, is sort of uh, also explains why certain people think that eating garlic will protect them from corona or that, oh, it only you know, affects Asian people and you just need to drink enough vodka and you'll be fine. 
So deferring to experts uh, is a very good idea in preparing for um, unpredictable events. Um, so at an organizational level, if you see how typical organizations prepare and how they manage risk, and then compare it to high, highly reliable organizations, uh, what you see is in typical organizations, you have you know, SWOT models and you have this whole uh, risk approach of internal risk, external risk, strategic. Uh, you have the strategic level, you have the operational level. So the way you deal it, you have a lot of guidelines, a lot of processes that you develop, and the organization knows what to do at a certain situation. The problem with that is if that situation doesn't occur in exactly that way, or if a, a different situation occurs that no one has thought of, the whole thing breaks. Highly reliable organizations do approach risk in a, in a completely different way. Um, so one thing they do is they approach it systematically. Uh, what I mean by that is um, they look at their own organization and their environment and look at all the things that can break and all the effects this can have. So uh, if you don't have water or if you don't have food, there might be different causes leading to this, but the effect is going to be the same. So how do you deal with the effect? That's, that's the core thing that they're focusing on. And going, going backwards from that, uh, they look at all the different elements within the system that can cause a breakdown in uh, water or food uh, delivery. Um, at the same time, they look at unpredictable risks. So all the things that you can't really uh, plan for, uh, the unknown unknowns, to, to quote uh, Cheney. And um, the way they, they uh, approach solving this is by making sure there is a culture in place that knows how to uh, deal with difficult situations uh, without waiting for uh, someone top down to tell them what to do or uh, to create a crisis team uh, or anything like that. Essentially, in a high reliable organization, the entire organization is set up of crisis teams. And they're in that mode the whole time. Um, and the same goes for how they uh, manage uh, operational risk. They actually don't. What they do instead is they have a competence risk model. What that means is um, making sure that people are trained in a well in a way, mentally, um, physically, emotionally, but also in terms of what they can do, that they're uh, flexible in how they approach problem solving and that they're uh, flexible in terms of uh, what they're really able to, to do. So developing uh, capacities is a, is a big, big thing. And um, to do that before you actually need it is, is um, uh, the way to, to approach it. So, um, Preparation essentially is, to boil it down, just taking the time to think things through. Uh, I think the statistic currently is only 20% of all organizations have some form of uh, disaster management or crisis management or risk management plan or strategy at all. And those that, that do have them, they follow a very traditional approach. So they're not building any knowledge. They're not making sure that they constantly acquire uh, competence within, within the people, within the system. Um, and they're also not creating a support system. Basically, every um, government, <clears throat> every organization is planning to solve it on their own. But that's a very, very bad approach. And that's not an approach that uh, highly resilient organizations take. So when you prepare for any future event, what you need to do is also create a support system around you that can go into effect when something happens. Um, for most people, this is their own social circle. But again, the social circle may not, may not be the right uh, group of people. And finally, preparation a lot is about readying your own mind and your own uh, emotions. That's why I pointed out uh, Seneca and uh, Hagakule uh, in the beginning. Um, because what those are pointing out is uh, two pretty simple facts. One of them is, well, everyone's going to die at some point. So you need to, if you haven't prepared for this, you haven't actually um, prepared for all the things that can happen to you in life. The other thing is, if you don't put yourself in, in situations that are difficult for you, that uh, scare you, 
then um, once these situations happen, you won't be able to, to react, you won't be responsible. So the, the core of the word responsibility stems from the fact that you can respond to any given event. And <clears throat> finally, once you have prepared, you just have to let go. Like I'm not running around preparing for all kinds of stuff. Um, I'm pretty relaxed in, in how I approach um, even the, the current situation. And this is also something you'll see in highly resilient organizations. Um, once um, the preparations are done, they're actually pretty relaxed uh, when crisis uh, happens. I mean, they, you know, people still get stressed out and, and burned out over time uh, as time goes on, uh, but they are able to uh, act within that given moment, which most of us who aren't trained are not. <clears throat> so to sum it up, really prepare for effects, not for specific causes. That's the way to uh, prepare for things that are unpredictable and prepare before something happens. Now, once uh, something like a pandemic hits, if you haven't prepared before, well, it's, you know, the trend's pretty, pretty much, pa pa as, I mean, um, sorry, <laughs> the trend's pretty much gone. Um, what, what should be, um, what you should be doing um, now that you're prepared for the pandemic is what comes after that and, and how to deal with that. So tr really trying to, uh, think things through and be two steps ahead of the curve is uh, the way to to prepare and the way to be able to to let go to to then be able to act and be adaptable. Um, so that's uh, very shortly what I have on the topic. I have also three exercises that can help you with that. It's it's not they're not exercises in the sense that it's something you can do on a daily basis. It's actually something that, that I use. Um, uh, and that's, um, I'm just going to give a, have a quick introduction in, into them and then we can either go straight into uh, those exercises or do a little Q and A first. Um, so the prism, it's actually pretty simple. Um, the prism is, um, so the, the line that goes in is the, the past and now uh, the current moment branches out into the future and you can have uh, the worst possible future and the best possible future and anything in, in between, right? And depending on, on what your actions are and what happens on the outside world, you'll be landing in, in, uh, within that bandwidth. Um, now, describing what those scenarios are, what, what those possible futures are, tells actually a lot about your own um, mindset and uh, a lot about how you approach life. And um, it also helps to um, navigate your own actions to make sure that you, you're moving towards the best possible future, not the worst one. Um, the second exercise is, is kind of similar to that, though it takes a different approach. Um, here you're actually describing not the, um, um, an abstract future, but it's your, your personal future. So within, within a future scenario that, that you see, which is abstract, where do you see your own life within that? So what's your personal heaven? What's your ideal future life? And what would be your personal hell? Um, and finally, there's something from um, that's uh, pretty familiar in scrum teams or agile teams, which is the start, stop, uh, improve, and keep uh, metrics. And um, what it helps you to do is to, again, look at your worst possible future, best possible future, and your heaven and hell within that. And then think about, okay, what do you need to start doing and stop doing to move towards what you think is an ideal future for you. Um, so these are all just writing or thinking exercises. They're, they're not special in any sense, but it really helps to uh, do them every once in a while. Um, so for me, it's like every three, four months, um, I look at what I've written in the past and, and, and use um, and expand on that. Uh, it's something we could do now. Describe according to the slide here, your personal heaven 
and your personal hell. And Ahmed, should we say like in three months from now, six months from now, is there any time um, constraint to this? Try to take about a year or a year and a half um, for this. This is a good time frame for, for most people. And, and do them in sequence. Like don't try to mix it up. So first, really try to think about what's the ideal life you could have in about a year, year and a half's time? Like what, what would be your heaven? And, you know, you can really, it should be realistic, but it should be, um, this is what I want, right? And, and the hell uh, essentially is, is the opposite of that. So once you've done the first, you can do the, uh, the other one or you can reverse the order if, if you like, but don't mix them up. Um, and your personal hell is, again, it's both are going to be personal to you. So someone else might look at them and go, Meh, you know, it doesn't seem that scary to me, but it really should be very, very personal because, um, all right, I'll stop here. Just let's get to it. As to this exercise, um, just just how you can um, move forward with this. Um, if you go back towards your own actions today, um, are they leading towards heaven or hell? And if they're leading towards hell, what are the things you need to stop doing so they, they don't lead there? Right. So you you have to think in terms of what do I need to start doing, but also what do I need to s stop doing or, or not to, to make sure that I take the direction I want. So what I find is that people who are uh, religious or um, follow some form of meditation routine or a, a stoic philosophy or, or philosophies along those lines, uh, they tend tend to be calmer um, either because they've they've contemplated their own mortality more, uh, or because they're they're taking this situation as it comes and and try to adapt to it. So you're not going to change someone's philosophy or worldview within just a few talks, right? Mm. Um, so the only thing you can do is uh, if there are people in your social circle, you know them pretty well, you know how they think and how they how they react. So what you'll need to uh, do is help them focus their current activity. Here's one thing that the um, uh, the British uh, Army does, but it's also something that the uh, Foreign Legion, the French Foreign Legion does. The first thing that you do when you uh, stop in the jungle uh, to make camp is a cup of tea, which is weird given the fact that you're a military organization and shouldn't you be, you know, you know setting, setting up defensive positions and stuff like that. No, the first thing you do is you make a cup of tea. The reason for that is there's a very clear structure to how you make a cup of tea. And um, it's something that, you know, this, this type of routine, if you do it over and over enough, it gives you something to focus on. It's basically uh, something you find in, in moving meditation, for instance. A lot of meditation techniques have, have things like that. Um, so making sure that people can focus their attention on something that is not difficult to do that they like doing or that they've been doing for a long time and just making a ritual out of that. And um, it's something you can even do on a video call by saying, Hey, let's, let's do a cup of tea together, have a tea time and relax and, and talk about the situation that can help uh, a lot in terms of how they can prepare um, if they haven't been preparing so far, essentially they can't. And, and you need to cope with that or they need to cope with that. Uh, essentially, um, to boil it down, make an accounting of your system, your own little world, um, family, resources, capabilities, um, network, and so on. Uh, and then what are the strengths and weaknesses of, of that system? And, and then if you can take a uh, list the peculiar peculiarities uh, of that, uh, then you can think in terms of, well, what happens if a certain thing breaks, then how can this system react to that? And if it can't, how can I make it more resilient so it can? Um, so for instance, the example I've given with my kids, if you make sure that your kids are pretty independent and um, are capable, then 
you're going to be more resilient than if you have kids that, you know, will drag you into all directions and cry the whole time. My take on it is you learn if you, if that is your intent. Um, as you said, there's a lot of things that happened in history that societies have not learned a whole lot from because we kept repeating them. Um, but then there are also a lot of things that we did learn from, uh, and we're not doing those things anymore. We're not repeating that, uh, not in, not even, uh, not just in single societies, but uh, as a species. So, um, but that takes intent. Learning takes intent. So you don't learn something automatically. What a lot of companies are discussing right now, and you can see it in, in, in the media is, well, once this is over, we'll go back to the offices. Well, maybe you don't need to, um, but that's not a learning that happens on its own. It needs to be discussed and reinforced and, and there needs to be an intent behind it. And unless there's intent, I don't think anything will be uh, learned. Um, so, I mean, you can set the clock to the next pandemic, which, you know, give or take every 10 years, there's, there's one round. Um, either it's stopped or it pushes through. Um, and then we'll see whether we have uh, enacted measures uh, in the next 10 years that will help prevent it. Um, but they're not going to happen automatically. We have to, you know, each one of us has to push for, for the learning to happen. Thank you, Ahmed. And um, I think this is also where I want to close the session for today. And I want to thank Ahmed and everybody else for joining. What I took away and what I hope a lot of people took away from this is we can prepare for a future and we have an active role in this. And it's up to us if we steer towards heaven or our personal health. With that, thank you for joining and I'm looking forward to see you next week.